Well, good morning again. Set the uh, I'm rounding the <laughs> last turn heading to the finish line. Here, it's really been a uh, it's really been a, a great week, and I can't thank you you guys enough for inviting me. It's sort of a special way to end. You know, coming back and seeing some old friends, uh, former medical students, former residents, former fellows. It's uh, a little bit of an old home week here for me. And so this has been just great. And when Peter asked me to, you know, pick some topics, uh, I sorted through what I thought might be um, interesting and or things that we do differently, perhaps, than other people. And so I came up with this endovascular talk and I have collected some thoughts on the present, the past, the present, and the future. And I entitled it Evolution, Revolution, Resolution. Right. Evolution is the process of growth and development. Charles Darwin theorized how humans came to be in their present form. And there are many uh, similarities in the uh, journey that has brought us to endovascular care. To the best of my ability to tell, this is the first mention in the literature of endovascular care for trauma. It's 1972. It's three patients from Mass General, right? Who would think that the first trauma paper in the New England Journal be, would be written by Mass General? Three patients in whom angiography was used to identify people that then had surgical hemostasis. So you think about uh, submitting a manuscript to the New England Journal with three patients, and I would submit to you that you couldn't hit send before they hit reject. But in 1972, this was apparently big news, and there it is. And, and pelvic embolization became a thing. And it, it, I, I told the residents, uh, earlier in the week, I still remember opening uh, a pelvic hematoma when I was a resident for hemostasis. It worked out oh so badly. And uh, I am still scarred 40 or 50 years later. So embolization made sense, but extra pelvic embolization really did not catch on because people said that the embolizers were weak-minded. You know, real surgeons operated. That's what we did. And then CT happened. And for the residents, I know it's hard for you to believe that I practiced medicine before the days of CT, but not everybody died. And then a couple of people from Brooklyn started to dream. And this is Sal Scofani and Jerry Shafton. They are, in my mind, the fathers of endovascular care for trauma. They thought big, they dreamed big, they wouldn't let people tell them that it was a bad idea because it wasn't. And I learned so much from my association with the two of them when I was in Brooklyn. This is one of the first splenic artery embolizations we did. It's 1984 when we began embolizing spleens. And you see that big, ugly gross coil coming out of the, uh, the catheter. 7-13-1984, I still keep this one around. And you can't even see the coil because of the rich collaterals that are feeding the spleen through the pancreatic branches and the short gastrics. This is how we designed proximal embolization. It, it, is, it is designed to maintain splenic viability, and this is the data from the 1995, the first series presented at East, then published in the Journal of Trauma with a 98.5% splenic salvage rate, which is pretty close to the best in the, uh, the literature. Now, I, I hearken back to that, to that day in Florida, when we presented this. I won't tell you who was the discussant for the paper, but he, no, he didn't kind of, he called us criminals. And he said, how could anybody be so obviously stupid to, to do something like this? It was not warmly received, let's just say. You fast forward to a couple of years ago, this is Margaret Lowerman's shock trauma data. This is 195 splenic injuries diagnosed on CT. 
The ones that came in with a positive fast and had primary surgery are out. These are people that had CT diagnosed splenic injuries. The protocol was everybody with a grade four got embolized. You see half of these were grade three, four, and five. These were not splenic scratches. 20% had a splenectomy after CT, but 78% were treated without a laparotomy. 36% had embolizations. We had a 0% failure rate in the 140 or 150 that we observed and or embolized. Now it's a high volume center, right? 50 a year or a 100 a year. Um, we, this is tightly protocolized and we operate on a lot of splenic injuries. We don't just put them in the bed and say, please don't bleed. 21% had splenectomy for new hypotension. At our institution, you get zero units of blood to, main, to salvage a splenic injury. You get transfused, you get a laparotomy. You have hypotension, you get a laparotomy. Other injuries that required or a change in exam. And so sometimes the patient comes back and I look at that and say, that's not going to work. And we operate that but 100% salvage. It's a little hard to do better than 100% salvage. Now, relative to the spleen, the liver is a, is a different organ, but embolization became an important part of damage control, right? If splenic embolization fails, you just take the spleen out. You can't, well, you can just take the liver out. I guess we talked about that, but you don't want to do that too often. And so, embolization or endovascular care for liver injuries became a very important part of damage control. And as we talk, you know, it could be pre-op, post-op, or the only thing. The next stop was the aorta. CT diagnosed aortic injuries. And there's the angiogram. There's the stent that covers the injury. This became SOP in every major trauma center in the United States. And this was the 2008 AAS2, AST2, as it became called, um, series th that was the first to demonstrate a highly statistically significant mortality advantage to endovascular care for aortic injuries. Now the evolution continued. We began experimenting. These were Mostly case reports, we kind of bragged about them at the bar. Some were great cases, but it was only one because we're trying to find our way to a program where endovascular care um, made sense. But there wasn't really any coordinated effort to advance the, the craft or even, frankly, to collect the data. And we kept learning and I kept wondering what was going to be next on the, this stage. Now, here are a couple of our wild cases. This is a guy uh, I talked about a little bit earlier in the week, and he came in with a uh, high-speed vehicular crash, had a positive fast, put a femoral outline in him. His blood pressure was 80. We took him to the operating room, took his spleen out. His blood pressure was still 80. And he had a normal chest x-ray. So I said, that doesn't make a lot of sense. and so I told the fellow here, you know, get him over to the scanner. I'm going to go up and push some papers. Call me when um, you've got some images. And uh, my fellow was a highly excitable young man at that point. And he called me up hyperventilating. And I said, Ali, first, I know this is hard for you. Stop talking. And secondly, in one sentence, tell me what the problem is. And he said, the radiology attending just called me and asked me if the patient is still alive. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. So I go running down and here's his reconstruction. And this is a huge posterior aortic injury just above the diaphragm. You see the celiac is out or seemingly out and the SMA looks injured. And I said, boy, that's really too bad. The guy's abdomen is open. It's not going to be clean. We got to put a graft in. We got to, you know, re-implant the SMA for sure. Maybe the celiac. And this is going to 
this is not appetizing at all. So I called the vascular guys at that point who were our, M our endo guys. And I said, how about we put a, a, um, a stent in this and just see what it looks like. He said, you know, that's never been done before. Yes, I'm well aware of the fact that it's never been done before. How about we do that instead of doing this open? And there is the angiogram post stent and the, it turns out the celiac and the SMA were both fine. This was the first case report of a stent graft for an injury outside of the left subclavian. My, actually, one of my nurse practitioners wrote the case report. This is a case I also talked about earlier. This is a young girl that came in with a high-speed vehicular crash. Her sister was actually injured more badly. Jim Han, one of my partners, was on call. He called me down and said, give me a hand. So we got her squared away. So just take a peek at her sister before you leave but i walked out and she had just come back from the scanner this is about 2000 i think this was the first time i'd ever seen contrast extravasation in a solid organ injury and i looked at that and said that's really too bad right she had a blood pressure of 80. i said that's a right hepatical back to me to fix this she'll die so i said yeah, let's do it a little differently she had four injuries that looked like that. Oops. We embolized her, took her to the operating room, decompressed her because she had abdominal compartment syndrome, packed her. I brought her back the next day and did a right hepatic well back to me under much better conditions. She lived. She went to nursing school. She became a nurse practitioner, and then I hired her because it's hard to find good nurse practitioners these days. And so we really stretch. Now, right, it's a case. It's just a case, but it's kind of a cool case, right? And we learned from each of these cases about the power of endovascular care. And we go now from evolution to revolution, a drastic far reaching change in the way of thinking and behaving. And I, I remember having this conversation with myself. I mean, we had something here, and, but the impediments were huge. We had little support from anybody in trauma or in the Department of Surgery didn't want to hear from us. Institutions, my institution, certainly in New York, was not interested in biting. And even in Maryland, it took some work. We needed a group to step out in front and a champion to drive this forward. And I made a very clear decision that the group was going to be our group and the, and the person was going to be me. And I said, we're going forward. That's what we're going to do. And this is a pivotal conversation I had with John Holcomb that I've told this story a thousand times. John came up to me at one of the meetings and said, what do you think about drinking fresh frozen plasma in the desert? I said, it's impossible said, that's not the question. Is it a good idea? And I said, of course, it'd be fabulous. And he said, then we've made the decision. The rest of this is just tactics. And that really changed the way I thought about what was possible. And we went forward. Three years later, we convened the first, probably I think the only, um, group to discuss catheter-based hemorrhage control and endovascular care for trauma. We did it in Houston, and this was the manuscript that memorialized that two-day meeting where everybody went into a room and got up and everybody could vent their spleen, and then we wrote the consensus opinion. So we defined fundamental competencies for this, and we made some recommendations, which you can quickly read through. I'd give us about a, I don't know, if I'm generous about a B minus on what we've accomplished in nine years, but we've accomplished some things. And most importantly, what this was Brent Eastman that got up and said this, we were talking a little bit earlier. We said, if we're going to do this, we have to peer review and benchmark our results against the experts. We're not as good as the guys that are doing it now that we shouldn't be doing it what we probably can be. And Robola happens right about this time, right? 
Everybody's seen the Carl Hughes, the slide, obviously 1945, pretty crude, but proof of concept. Now, this is a, a true story. On February 18th, 2013, Megan was my first year vascular fellow. She remembers this. I, of course, did not, but she said, I was in the OR hallway. She is, she's there and I'm running to the true. And I say, go grab that balloon thing and bring it to OR4. And that was the first Rabot we put in. It was the second in the country. And four years later to the day, we presented 90 patients at the Pacific Coast. The rest is history. Now, everybody, you know, those of us that were around remember the 12 French sheets and the big ugly catheters and having to fix every femoral artery and doing them almost all through cut downs and, and, and. Now we don't do that. And now there are two more generations of Raboa and a, 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 the new one that I just reviewed that'll be ready for prime time in the next year or two. This is the first series. It's the first six patients, the first modern series that we published in 2013. I think it was three from Maryland and three from Houston. And what we had was proof of concept here. Can we do it? Yes. Is it safe? Yes. Does it work? Yes. And it's in this case was mostly blood trauma and mostly as the bridge to embolization, which I thought was at least an interesting observation. Is it a good idea? And I, I became very direct with Megan and said, it's not a toy, it's a study. And so she said, I will study this. And by God, she did. I just reviewed her um, CV to write her a letter of recommendation. And she has since 2013, 65 Reboa publications. I told her to study it and she actually did. This was one of them. This was, can we train people to put the Reboa in? And if you are training people with some procedural skills, it turns out about a day, it maybe doesn't make you an expert, but it gets you familiar with what it feels like to put it in. Does it work? Well, that's the million dollar question. And this is some of Megan's 2018 data. Uh, and there was a highly statistically significant survival advantage. We just published our single institution uh, propensity score matched stuff earlier this year. There's a highly statistically significant uh, mortality advantage. Of course, if you go to Arizona and you talk to Bilal, this is I think T-Clip data, he says it's the instrument of the devil. It doesn't work and more people die. And so we are still working through that. Um, it would seem pretty clear that it, at higher volume centers that do this much more highly protocolized, that it works and that other places perhaps not so much. Partial Reboa becomes a thing. Uh, Rene Russo's data, this is an animal model where you can see partial Roboa doesn't give you the same hemodynamic punch, but the downstream ischemia injury is so much less than you get with zone one complete occlusion. Now, what's the deal? Well, this is uh, maybe three months ago data. I haven't uh, seen the, the most recent data, but we are now up at eh, 210, 220. But when you look at this, this is, you know, at least the people that are reporting their data to, to the um, AAST database, and you can see about 40%, is that about right? Uh, yeah, about 40% come from two places. And then you've got 33 centers that have put less than 10 in over six years. So perhaps not a robust clinical experience. And so how can you um, reconcile that? I, you'll reconcile it as you like, but I think it is, it's about volume and fitting it in. Roboa is not a cure. It's something that buys you time to get to a cure. And if you don't have the cure in there, then you don't, the Reboa doesn't help you a hell of a lot. 
Now, um, this was a complicated study that we did. Ron Tesserero presented at the AAST. And uh, quite frankly, when they, he, he came to me with the data and he says, do you know how embarrassing this data is? Do you really want me to present and publish this? And I said, uh, yes, we need to be honest. This is in fact the truth. And if it's true here, it's true other places. So there you have it. Mean time to pelvic embolization, five hours. 80% of the deaths attributed to uncontrolled hemorrhage and linked to delays in hemostasis. This is a slide from Dr. Shafton that he gave to me. It was one of those blue diazo slides when he gave it to me years and years and years ago. And it, but it may, it reminds me that this is about a continuum of safe care and how you do it is how you do it. We do it differently, maybe. This is the University of Maryland Medical Center. The interventional radiology suite is 1.5 city blocks away from the resuscitation unit. There is nothing quite as lonely as being an IR with a, a person bleeding from their liver or their pelvis at about three in the morning on Sunday. It's not quite true. MRI is a little further away, but that's the only thing that's further away. And I said, how can this make sense? It can't. This is the new tower. Ronnie Stewart shot the picture. My camera skills are not nearly what Ronnie's are. And this is the hybrid, right? So now we have a room in the operating suite that is located to room 11 from TRU Bay 1 is about 60 feet, which is a lot closer than a block and a half. And it's our anesthesiologists, it's our OR staff, it's our x-ray techs, it's our control. And so it's different. Now I called the interventional radiology guys and I said, hey, I've got this great idea. We've got this hybrid operating room. We don't have to wait for the techs to come in. You can come in right away. It'll be all teed up for you when you get here. It's the same equipment you use. It's the same Zego. So you'll fit right in, come on down. And they said, yeah, we're not coming. And I said, okay, we're not calling. And we stopped calling. And I hired my own endovascular surgeons. These are the first two. It's Melanie Hain and Megan, right? Triple boarded, general surgery, vascular, critical care, trauma mostly trained by us. And uh, they became our endovascular team. This is the 2016 first series. It was again, proof of concept. You can see that um, we started slow about 10 a month. We now do 250 endovascular cases for trauma per year. And it's, uh, you know, it's the mix and match, right? It's T-bars, it's spleens, it's pelvises, it's some filters, it's whatever came down the pike that uh, period of time. We really, again, we continued to um, study this. We uh, had this idea that using a radial approach would be more efficacious. So this is the data on the radial approach as opposed to the femoral ap approach. Complications went down. We now do the pelvises via the radial. We do the spleens via the radial. And, and so it's really, it's a lot nicer. You get the arm out, you have access to the middle of the torso. It's, if you're doing a hybrid procedure, it's really nice. And this is the, the American surgical presentation that looked at time and volume when we were doing our own versus taking a block and a half trip. The total volume went up, the cases didn't change. 
we just had people that were that were really looking to do cases. And the time was cut in half, right? The pelvis went from four and a half to about two and change. The livers went about the same. The extremities went down substantially. The spleens didn't change. That's right. If you're unstable, you just get your spleen out. So the spleens shouldn't change, and they didn't. Now this is where I'd like to say we're the smartest, but oh, that's right. You guys thought about this as well. And this is the Gainesville data presented at the Southern two years ago, I guess, right, Steve? Yes, right. And very, very similar results. Quicker to the OR, hybrid OR, you can do open and angiographic cases simultaneously and Mortality the same, I get that. It's hard to show mortality difference, but process improvement at a highly statistically significant level. Now, I brought a couple of cases. This is a, a true hybrid case. This is a, a kid that uh, I got a call. They said, oh, he's got this terrible liver injury. He's a football player. And I roll my eyes and go, oh, that's, I'm sure this is terrible, terrible for you, but so I said, send them down, please. And I said, wow, that's a terrible liver injury. Wow, he's really got it. So we take him to the operating room. There's the blush. He gets embolized. We decompress his liver. We get hemostasis. We pack him. There he is three months later. Turns out this kid is actually a very good college football player. And uh, I think will enter the NFL draft this year. So him getting back to playing football, kind of an important thing for him to make his livelihood. This is a, a more typical Baltimore. This is a guy with multiple gunshot wounds, of course, right through the middle of his liver into his abdomen. And you can see that he's got a nominate artery pseudoaneurysm. So he gets a simultaneous laparotomy, angiography. We cover his nominate pseudoaneurysm with a stent, uh, one-stop shopping. And this is our new toy. This is the Venus balloon, which I find uh, really a very, very helpful adjunct. So you, we marry it with a zone one Reboa. The bridge balloon is a very large 60 cc long sausage shaped balloon that we position behind the liver to occlude cable injuries. You can do it pre-op, you can do it intra-op. It's got radiographic markers if you're placing it fluoroscopically, so you can get it right where you want to. If it's intra-op, you can just feel the guide wire go up and then you can position it under direct vision. This is the first kid we used it on. Uh, a grade five liver, grade five kidney, grade five spleen. We put it in and then, then did her case open and she did beautifully. This is the first Five, we have now have just, I did not add the sixth person because he hasn't lived yet, though I think he's going to. And uh, great vascular control, particularly in the retrohepatic cable or the perirenal cable injuries. And um, it is, you get complete hemostasis. You put, blow the balloon up. There is zero bleeding because all the posterior veins are occluded as well. You can then dissect the, the uh, veins out, put loops on them, put your finger on the hole, pull the, the blue down, pull the guide wire out, put some vascular clamps on and fix it, it works well. Now this concept of endovascular resuscitation it took me a while to, to come to. And it's this sort of heroic, if you will, resuscitation. A and it's about really preventing the consequences of shock. It's expansive. It challenge challenges the status quo. And endovascular care is at the middle of these things. This is data from Vietnam. Peter Saffer and Ron Bellamy looked at this and they said, yeah, you know, maybe 65% of deaths 
are essentially poor kids that were killed in action. But if you get out there, there's another 25% or so that if you could support them, that maybe you could fix them. And Dr. Schaffer, who was one, was one of my just favorite people to be around. I could just feel the, he was so smart. I would just sit next to him and I would absorb whatever it was he was uh, preaching that day. He said, how about if we induce very deep hypothermia? So this is some animal data that shows that animals, if you can get them down to 15 degrees, animals will tolerate 60 or 90 minutes of cardiac arrest, will reanimate and will wake up. There is a single institution clinical trial, it's us. We had to suspend it for COVID because A, it was COVID and B, we had a very bad blood shortage during the, and, and these people go through 50 or so um, units of blood. We learned a huge amount. We're, we got five patients into the series before COVID happened. Putting them on is really not very hard. You do a left thoracotomy, you occlude the aorta, you retrograde cannulate the a thoracic aorta, you run 50 liters of ice saline in on a pump, pressurized. What we did is we just drained it into the chest via a right atrial cannula and whatever spilled out, we just sucked up. And we were able to get people down to 15 degrees in about 10 to 15 minutes. We made no attempt to restart their heart. We walk to the OR, they go on bypass, and then we fix their injuries. It turned out the mechanics of doing that were re it was really not that hard. The thing that was hard was manipulating the clotting system. And how you did that, what you do that, when you, you, know, when you give them protamine was a, um, is an issue we are still working on. The uh, biggest problem was crowd control because as soon as the, the page went out, Everybody showed up to help, but they, they weren't very much help. They just got in the way. And patient number five came off bypass with a blood pressure of 120 over 80 and a heart rate of 80, not on any vasoactives. And frankly, I think I made a judgment error. I should have just done a pneumonectomy. He had a cardiac injury and a hyalur lung injury. And I did a lobe. And then he bled off the staple line. If I'd taken his whole lung out, that might have been smarter. And then we could have just bridged him to ECMO to recovery. And so we're close. Now, there are other catheters that are available. This is selective aortic arch perfusion. This is the brainchild of a, kid, a guy named Jim Manning. Jim's an emergency physician from Chapel Hill. And you can see it's, it's Reboa on steroids. You slide it all the way up to the arch. It's got a lumen so you can deliver blood and drugs into the heart. He really invented it for medical cardiac arrest. But we have believed that the real application is going to be trauma. And this is just um, some of the animal data that shows that myocardial blood flow is immensely better with. Uh, the selective aorta arch, arch perfusion catheter in, as opposed to doing CPR. And so we come to hopefully some degree of resolution. The uh, welcome for these techniques has not gotten any warmer, only now we just fight, right? We fight about who's gonna do the case, we fight about who's gonna hold the wire, and we mostly fight about who's gonna get the money. We ignore the patient and the need to deliver care in a system. Leaders in our own specialty badmouth these techniques, just like they did in 1995 when we first did the splenic artery embolization. They have no experience, no knowledge, but they know it's a bad idea. And people on the other side, people that are self-proclaimed experts are teaching courses, never actually have an inserted one 
into a human being. We fail to have any commitment, and there are a thousand ways for us to get to know. Now, do we need something different? Hell yes, we do. This is John Harvin's 2017 data, 12 level one US setter, and you can see the times. The mortality, if you presented in shock, the mortality was 40%. And everybody said, that can't be true. All right, then you go analyze it. Mortality was 40%. It was the exact same number that John Clark reported in 1986. We think we're better. We hope we're better. But you can't tell me that telling the pre-hospital guys to drive faster fixes this. Look, look at the times, right? 46 minutes in the pre-hospital air setting, 24 minutes in the ED, 42 minutes, and then you got to get hemostasis. So we are talking about an hour and a half or two hours from injury to hemostasis. Driving five minutes quicker isn't going to change that. And there's the data in uh, tabular form. Hemorrhage is the most common cause of death and the mortality is 40%. The thing that was the most striking to me is the incredible variability in level verified level one trauma centers in the United States. It's obviously blinded, but somebody was 25% and somebody was 80%. Now, I'm certain we were the 25%, but maybe we weren't. No idea. And that's how you, you can see it, again, schematically. The time to death is early. And so we need to figure out a system that up, loads up front with hemostasis. And I'm going to tell you, it's not going to be in the emergency department. And so what we have is this arc of resuscitation. I stole this from Todd Rasmus, and it's his concept that starts with standard care and goes over to EPR and, and SAP and technologies that we haven't even yet invented. But that's the future. And you can't tell me that we can't do it. This is one of my favorite photos. This is the French pre-hospital guys cannulating for some somebody for ECMO in the Louvre. If they can do it in an art museum in Paris, we can do it as well. And so I have this concept that we are working on. It's going to be incredibly expensive. That will take us to the scene. Now, we're not going to do it in downtown Baltimore where they can come to us quicker then we can go to them. But there are going to be a bunch of places outside of the city, right, where the quickest thing is to put us in a chopper and take us to the scene, not to take them to a rural trauma center to be stabilized. And or maybe we will meet them in their emergency department. We were talking earlier about cannulating and we will cannulate them. And here is in my mind, what the new arc will be. So endovascular care outside of the hospital to the hospital, to resolution, rehabilitation and reintegration. So welcome to the world of endovascular resuscitation. That's what these techniques are as far as I'm concerned. The resuscitation tools. They are organ support, but they are mostly resuscitation tools. Now, who's going to do this? To the best of my ability to tell, these are the one, two, about 17 people that are triple boarded. And I'm pleased to see all but three came through Maryland. So I understand that um, not everybody is going to birth these people. But these people are now leaving and going out to other places in the United States to set up their ideal. 
of what um, you know, Joe is now in Austin. Johnny is going to the Mayo Clinic. Megan is in South, Southern Cal. Melanie was just left Denver. And you can see it's spreading. And we think that the answer is that we should be training people in this. We have developed a didactic curriculum that we believe we can cover in a year. It turns out if you come to my institution and you're willing to take call every other night, as long as you get called in every other night, and you spend one year, you will accumulate sufficient experience that you would be able to, to sit for the vascular, the endovascular part of the vascular surgery boards and the interventional radiology boards. We're busy enough that we can train people. And these of course are kids that are trained in surgery. So they don't come with zero, you know, you're a radiology resident. You don't have a robust experience during your residency with catheters and wires. You, you train in a busy surgical training program between the critical care part and the vascular part and the trauma part, you are not a complete neophyte with those techniques. And um, just broken down by, the only thing we're a little short on is stent grafting, but we'll, we're gonna work on that. And so this is the current or very recent endovascular group. And when it was just Johnny and Joe, the, the, the name was J and J Plumbing. And when Rishi came, they put him in charge of marketing and said, we need a new name. And this is the current logo, Lazarus Plumbing as we rise from the dead. And this is the new shock trauma endovascular group. Johnny, as I said, is going to Mayo, Joe is in, and that's Chuck Fox, who uh, was at Denver and is now with us. That's Anna Romagnoli in the center, who uh, was our fellow, just finished at Mass General. And when she gets back from someplace in Eastern Europe where she's currently deployed, she will be part of our group. And Yvonne Chung will join us in September, I think. She is finishing her vascular training at Washington, uh, at St. Louis University and will be the, the, the newest of the triple boarded people. Now, is this on the way? Yeah. I mean, all of the data says that endovascular care is simply getting more common. And you can see the, um, the numbers are getting better and the results are getting better. This is up through 2010. This is Anna's data from 2019. Same thing, it's, it's up to about 10% of all vascular injuries are now treated endovascularly. If you look at non-compressible blunt trauma hemorrhage, right? Liver, spleen, pelvis, 40% treated with endovascular care with less length of stay and less mortality and less transfusion. It's for those of for those people that came to this uh, kicking and screaming. It's hard to say doing it the old way is doing it in a better way. This is our data looking at TVAR. Open aortic repair is an operation that is no longer done in the United States. It's just not done. TVAR is used for all of these injuries. Um, some more data from us. This was, I think, t -quip data looking at, at iliac injuries and amputation rates less if you do it with endovascular resources. And this is, I was telling you guys, this is the most current axillo subclavian data. It's the group from Memphis presented at last year's Southern, just published a month or two ago in the Journal of the American College of Surgeons, mortality advantage in penetrating trauma, and the only modifiable risk factor for mortality was the use of endovascular care. And you know, we, we now do 
all, we have done one open subclavian in the last few years. Deb did it, a guy that came in with a gunshot wound, actually, yeah, right there, that came in with no blood pressure and a rapidly expanding um, hematoma. We did that guy open. It was a mess, but we, we got it done and the patient did well. Now, we do these with a, we put a wire across the injury from the proximal side. We then go up the radial and put a wire across the injury. And with a snare, we grab the wires and pull them through with a, a technique that we at least call rendezvous. And then we use the wire to pull the um, stent across the injury and deploy it. The average time to do it that way is about 20 minutes. And, and I think I'm pretty good at this, but I can't fix it open in 20 minutes. I'm, about that, I'm 100% sure. We have some other sort of tricks that we are playing with. This is our, our look at how we do um, iliac injuries in a contaminated field. We just put a graft in and then we stent the graft inside with a <clears throat> technique we have called sock and sleeve. Dr. Morrison's from Great Britain, so he's always got some catchy uh, descriptive term to de describe this. And we're about, I don't know, six or seven um, patients into the series has been very gratifying. So we're not doing axillary femoral bypasses or any of that. We're just stenting that. And there's one we did, I don't know, about a year ago, maybe, with a stent across the repair. We've done this once where we had some lady come in with a popliteal that was many hours out and we're trying to get her teed up. So in the resuscitation unit, we shunted her from her, her contralateral femoral and retrograde perfused her up her uh, dorsal, her uh, posterior tibia. So we put a sheath in the posterior tibial, reperfused her, and then got her to the operating room. And we actually stented her popliteal as a damage control, and then went back six weeks later when she was well and did her bypass graft. Is it a good idea? Uh, I don't know. This is more data from Bilal, Joseph, and the guys in um, in Tucson. This is, I think, also this is NTDB data. You know, it is coming. Whether it is a good idea or a bad idea, right? Is a stent graft for a popliteal artery injury a good idea? We would say no, but there are many people that are starting to stent these whether we think it's a good idea or not. And we get about one a month transferred to us that's usually had not such a good outcome with a stent in some place that probably should not have been stented. And then we get to go take the stent out and try to salvage the extremity. Um, perhaps not the world's best idea. Now, this was a statement I was looking, I was actually doing um, a, putting together the pelvic fracture talk, and I read through this. This was an editorial statement made in 2003, I think, for a paper that Brian Eastridge wrote. So I read through that, and I said, wow, 2003. It's kind of a far-reaching opinion in 2003 to think about doing this. And then I saw who wrote it. Frankly, I had forgotten that I had written that, but apparently in 2002, I at least was thinking about this as well. The revolution, rejuvenation, recapitulation, all of this I, concept I stole from Mike Rotundo. This was Mike's, the title slide from his presentation when he came to give our named trauma lecture. So fair is fair. He really taught me the way to think through this longitudinally. Now, 
this is a quote from Roger Sherman, which I just think is fabulous. I found it some months ago when I was putting the lecture together. The opening, or maybe not always open, exploration and repair of living human body is an awesome responsibility afforded only to a few. To be privileged, to be counted among those is a high honor surpassed only by being trusted to teach others this demanding and marvelous craft. I just can't think of a better way to think about what it is we do. This is for Dr. Shafton. This is Jerry, the year he gave the scutter with his wife, Bernice. He died two years ago, I guess. In his early 90s, every time I would publish a paper, I would know that the phone was going to ring and Dr. Shafton would call me. And he'd say, you know, you, died, you, you analyzed the data wrong. I'm sorry, sir. He read everything that got written on trauma up to the time of his death. And he had a keen mind. He taught me so much. And I will forever be grateful to the effect he had on my career. So the evolution, revolution, maybe resolution is a 35-year story. I, I, I frankly think it's fascinating. I don't think we've embraced this as we need to. We need to understand history to chart the future. We can't let others do this. So as I said earlier today, this is me handing off to you guys. I'm about done. You guys are either just starting or just getting warmed up. But I'll be the old guy in the, in the corner. And if you abandon it or get it wrong, I promise you that I will haunt you for the rest of your life. Now, I'd, I'd always heard about this Florida visiting professor thing, and my phone never rang. And I said, I guess I'm just not, that's not going to be anything I, I get to do. Made me, a, you know, it just wasn't going to work. And then the phone rang this year, and I, I can't tell you how pleased I was when I got the invitation. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for this honor. It's really been a wonderful experience, and I thank you guys for your attention.